So good morning. Happy Sunday to all of you. If you're practicing Sabbath, I pray that these words bless you during your Sabbath experience. Uh, Tyler is tackling some of the hardest topics in Christian communities ever. He's labeled this series tough questions, and rightfully so. I think they're tougher on you than they're going to be on your community. But what I'm hoping for is that these controversial, really difficult topics, they stretch you and bring you closer to Jesus. They're topics that we have to talk about, and they're topics that are misunderstood in our community. And, and I, my topic today is no different. So I've been here a couple times. I talked about discipline the first time I was here. I talked about Sabbath the second time I was here. Both of those topics for me were things that I was walking through. There were seasons, God does this, seasons of my life that discipline was a real problem for me. Um, The topic of Sabbath has been something that I've been earnestly working on really diligently over the last year, and and I'm still not perfect at it, but certainly when I spoke about it, I was pretty honest about how much that was a struggle for me. In both of those cases, I really reflected on how God was working in me and then shared that with you. Today's topic is different. Today's topic for me is really at the heart of my walk with Jesus. And actually, as I thought about it when I was, when I picked this topic, it was hard for me to separate myself from this topic. It was really difficult. Like, it is just who I am, how I breathe, how I walk, how I talk. And so we're going to talk about evangelism today. And what's weird is, like, literally, probably 12 years ago, I didn't even know what this topic, I didn't know what that word meant, if I'm being honest. But now, it's like at the heartbeat of who I am. This topic really is the act of spreading the gospel through personal witness or teaching. It's more specifically how we spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And our topic today is is this really hard question, is evangelism or spreading the gospel a form of forcing my beliefs on people around me? Why this topic really strikes a chord for most people today in in our culture is that Canadians particularly, we're known for like saying, I think one of our famous phrases, I'm sorry. We say it all the time. It's like, well, you know, I hope I didn't offend you. I'm really sorry. So, So you can imagine culturally for us, this is really difficult. But I think it's actually just global. I think, I think we are really worried about offending people in our world today. Uh, we're really, really worried about pissing people off. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, you're okay, okay. Uh, we're really worried about like bothering people with our views in particularly Christianity. And I think in this area, like spreading the gospel of Jesus. This, like, fear of offense is what's harming our church today. It's at the core of what's not growing the church. And so my goal today is really to dispel that evangelism is any kind of forcing of belief on who you are as a person. It's, It's not really about trying to, like say, hey, you're wrong, I'm right, by the way, come on to church with me. That's, that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about evangelism. So I'm hoping to dispel that. I'm also hoping that you have like this deep awakening that this actually isn't like something that you have an option in. Like there's no option here. This is not like optional if you're a Christ follower. This is actually at the core of Christian, Christian messages and Christian hearts. It should be. And somehow we've lost our way. So here we go. Let's dive in. First, I think it's important to tackle why evangelism is so important to Jesus and why it's not optional. I can't just say that and walk away. But So after Jesus' death on the cross, after he was buried and then resurrected on the third day, we just celebrated this for Easter. I'm sure you guys had a beautiful Easter celebration here. Before he sent it into heaven, he appeared to his disciples in Galilee and he gave them these instructions. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Go, action word, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This section of scripture is known in our world, in in the Christian world, as the Great Commission. And it was the last recorded personal instruction of our Savior Jesus Christ to his disciples, and it holds great significance to all of his followers. The full text is known in Matthew 28, 16, 20, 16 to 20, which is what I just sh- uh, shared with you. But it's found in every single gospel. You, it's there. Like, it's not missing from any of the four gospels. It's repeated, not in the exact verbiage, but it's repeated in every, every one of the gospels. It was that important. 
And although each version varies, there's something very common about all of them. These passages recorded the same encounter with Jesus and his disciples after the resurrection, and in each instance, Jesus sends his followers out with specific instructions. He uses directions such as go, teach, baptize, forgive, and make. Not one of those words is passive. This tells us that nothing about evangelizing to the globe, nothing about evangelizing to our nation is meant to be at home in your living rooms by yourself. It's not a passive suggestion. It is an instruction to get out and do the heavy lifting. This is really important for you to remember because many Christians tend to think that the act of spreading the gospel is your pastor's job or your elder's job or your mentor's job. They think that maybe it'll happen if I just pray, sit at home and pray. And that's good. Like, please don't get me wrong. Start praying about evangelizing. But in the command by Jesus, he isn't just saying to think about it. He isn't just saying to wish about it. He isn't just saying to hope about it. He's actually saying, go, do, act, make disciples of all nations. And so please take note, this is not a passive suggestion. And because it's repeated in all four Gospels, if you're a Christ follower, even if you're new, please know that if it's repeated in all four Gospels, it's really important. Because this command is written about in all four Gospels and Christians from ages and ages and ages have known that uh, this, this is the Great Commission, most Christians actually today know that it's really important. And if you're new in your faith, if you didn't know this, that's okay. But quite frankly, most Christians know that this is kind of the centerpiece. You know, aside from death and resurrection, we must go and make disciples. The fact is 95% of Christians, actually, in a recent study done by Barna, which is one of any church leader knows who Barna is. They do these studies for us and tell us how terrible the church is right now. 95% of all Christians understand that this is an important message, that Jesus is so important that we must deliver that message to others. So 95%. The survey gets really specific and says um, 94% believe that the best thing that could ever happen to a human being on this earth is if they came to know Jesus. 94%. This is good, right? It went even further and said 86% of the people that they surveyed, which was a big, this was a big survey, this was not small, 86% said they felt fully equipped to share their story about coming to know Jesus and that they could answer faith questions. Amazing. So it's not fear. They know that it's important. Hence, should be no problem. Here's the, here's the sad truth. Anybody under the age of 40 feels conflicted about sharing the gospel of Jesus. And in fact, 47% feel it's, it's wrong. It, that they shouldn't do it. So we have a problem. The reason why I gave you the age number there is because the growing church, the younger church, thinks that sharing the gospel is actually in conflict with who they are as people, and yet they know that it's important and that it will change somebody's life. And so you can tell that I'm passionate about this. And I'll tell you why in a minute. You're going to find out. So why the disconnect? People feel equipped to share the message. They know that it's important, yet they pause. In fact, many have critiqued... Ugh, get ready for this one. Many have critiqued the Christian community saying that the Great Commission is actually not the Great Commission, but it's just the Great Suggestion. Like, you know, we kind of suggest that maybe if you have time, like on a Friday afternoon at the end of the work week, that you, you might just want to mention Jesus somewhere in your day. It's not the Great Suggestion. The sad truth is in no way did Jesus leave this earth and say that this was a suggestion. No, the Lord actually commanded his followers from every generation to put their faith into action and to go and make disciples. Surprisingly, what's going to bother you, I'm hoping even more, is that in our world, we're actually not opposed to gospel preaching at all. We preach lots of gospels today. Tons and tons of gospels are being preached. Go on any social media channel, any YouTube channel, any even book that you're reading, there is many gospels being preached. The gospel of sexuality is alive and well. The gospel of politics and which political like party will take us into the next generation. The gospel of health and wellness, like live your best life, go and work out, eat organic, all of these things. The gospel of tolerance, 
which is the scariest gospel of them all. And that's the gospel that says, you do you, I'll do me, I'll sit in my house and I'll be fine teaching my family this, but I won't worry about your family over there. We're just so afraid to offend people. And I really liked in the prayer this morning or in the psalm that you shared, you said um, that testimony of, of the Asian men and that they had their knees broken. I think this is breaking our knees spiritually this gospel of tolerance. It's like, we're so afraid to spread this good news. It's kind of crippling. So all of these quote-unquote gospels have main stage priority in our world, and yet Jesus Christ is on the back burner. Sadly, almost feels immoral to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in our world today. And because we have such a high value on tolerance, it's almost like when we speak about Jesus, we're doing something wrong. Like, oh, wow, you know, I go to church on Sundays. I hope it doesn't offend you. Wow. Like, even just saying that out loud. I've said that. Like, I've said something along the lines of that in my journey. Oh, by the way, I'm a Christ follower. Not by the way. Like, hey, I'm a Christ follower. You want to come? Right? This is leading us into this faulty belief that evangelism is forcing our beliefs on other people. And I want you to know that I tempered this with the thought that I understand that the church has not done us any favors to help this. I understand that sometimes we have seen really ugly things come out of the church. And so that has made it even harder for us to spread the true, loving, amazing gospel of Jesus. I get it. I get it. And yet... We still must do the work. So I'm here to share with you today that this way of thinking is dangerous. This, this way of th- thinking that you're forcing your beliefs on people is dangerous because it's costing people their lives. It could have cost me my life. Totally. I wasn't a Christ follower in 2005. I would not be standing here today if someone actually bought into the gospel of tolerance. If someone said hey, you know, I'm not going to, I know I can see that Nadia is struggling. I can see that family is struggling, but I'm just not going to do anything about that. I'll just hope somebody else takes notice. I'll hope somebody else pays attention to the fact that she's struggling. I'll hope somebody else pays attention to the fact that she was at the peak of her career and yet she just quit to go work with her husband. I'll I won't pay attention to the fact that I can see that she's cried. I won't pay attention to the fact that her marriage is broken. I won't pay attention to the fact that she's depressed and sad and really just lost. I won't pay attention to that. I'll just sit at my desk at work and not pay attention. But that didn't happen. That didn't happen because I'm here speaking to you today and I know Jesus and he's at the center of my life. So I'm going to introduce you to someone today that changed my life forever. She will not take credit for it. She'll just say she was a vessel. She says it all the time. I can, I'm looking right at her. She's like nodding her head at me. Um, and, and I thought there was no better way for me to talk about evangelism than to tell you how I was evangelized to because that, like, that's the true form of evangelization is that telling my story to you hopefully will inspire you to tell that story to somebody else and your story to somebody else. So let me just first start by saying... Sue Barnes, if she's here today, thank goodness she's here today, uh, and I met, we met in 2001. We were both working at St. Joseph's Hospital here in London, Ontario. We worked together for a few months, and we instantly connected, and in fact, Sue and her husband, we actually, Sue's husband introduced my husband to his next career at the cooperators, and then they worked together. So we were two wives working together, two, two husbands working together. And as I said, I was at the peak of my career. I literally had just won an award for being one of the best new up-and-coming fundraisers in London, Ontario. And all of, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I quit my job. And I said I was going to work with my husband. And it was a shocker to most people. Um, I need you to know that what I noticed about Sue the first, the first time I met her was that she would never swore. She didn't gossip. She was eerily joyful. Like... <laughs> Like, it's, it's almost inhuman how, how happy Sue is. She's always smiling. She smi- I, I can't look at her because it's going to make me cry. She smiles with her eyes. She smiles with her voice. Uh, she never, we had a really uh, unique experience in that time that we were working. We merged two organizations, and it was, 
It was very stressful, wasn't it, Susie? Yeah. And here I am, non-Christian, I'm just going to admit, that I was like gossiping and I was angry and I was sad and I was bitter and it made me terrible and I was struggling at home and now struggling at my work and I thought the work was the only thing that I could count on. And every time I would go to Sue and complain, I actually stopped going to her because she would never complain back. (laughs) I'm like, this is no fun. She's telling me like, well, you know, you got to understand that everybody, everybody's just trying their hardest. She's amazing. She's amazing. I was driven. I was getting ahead in my career, as I said. Um, but at home, like, really, my life just sucked. I can't, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to try to, like, sugarcoat it. Everything was really hard. We had two kids. My husband and I were fighting all the time, and we had already really figured out that that, um, divorce was, like, imminent. We were, like, probably six months away from divorce. And then at the last possible ditch effort, we kind of, like, thought, well, why don't we give this a try? I'll quit my job, because really, I was a workaholic. I can see that now. I couldn't see it then. I'll quit my job, which made me a martyr, and I loved it at the time. Like, I absolutely, I'm like, I'm going to quit my job, and I'm going to save this marriage. You can see that that was, like flag in the cap. It was so good. Um, and I, I quit my job, which I loved, and, um, and I went to go work with my husband. And it was kind of our last, last ditch effort. We also started a little bit of counseling, and that counselor had said to us, well, you got to go on a date night every week because you got to like reconnect because you guys aren't connected. And I must have said that at one point. Sue probably doesn't even remember this. But Sue actually said to me, well, maybe you should do your date night with me. And I was like, mm what the heck is happening? So, okay, Sue, come on up. This, everybody give her a warm welcome. How can I look? <laughs> oh, sorry, that was like, that was personal, but anyway, you were. Okay, so, let me, I, got, I have questions because I, I geared her up. So, listen, Sue, tell the world here, all hundred and something, I think we've grown. Tell the world here why you felt compelled to invite me into a conversation about Jesus. Well, first of all, I, I, I'm going to answer that question. I really am. But I wanted to just take you back a little bit in my story and how I came to that point. Um, Way to go, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I do, didn't grow up a Christian, um, but we lived out west, and I was introduced to Christianity and I thought, this is amazing. Um, and then we moved. We moved to London. And my marriage was going through some difficult times at, at that point, too. And I stepped back, as Nadia did. And, um, but I found that, that something was missing, definitely missing. And so I saw this ad in the newspaper. Today, you would see it on social media. Um, <laughs> the newspaper is a piece of paper that would come every day. <laughs> I just thought I'd fill them in. Yeah, go ahead. And it talked about an alpha program. And I went, oh, what's that? I wonder what that's about. And it happened to be at a church that wasn't far from us. And so I thought, hmm, I'll give this a try. And it was held in a, an adjoining house that was for the deaf church. Anyway, I went and a light bulb went off. I was born in England, and Alpha was created in England by a man called Nicky Gumbel. I understood totally his sense of humor. I got it, and it really was a light bulb that went off, and I went away thinking, I have to tell the world about this. This is so amazing, and it really was, and I thought um, that if I liken it to when you have your first love or you're, you're engaged and you go, I've got to tell the world about this wonderful man I'm engaged to. <laughs> or, and you just can't be quiet. You just have to go out and tell everybody. And that's what I felt. And so I really felt that God gave me that gift, if we want to call it evangelizing. It really, it's a heart of me that I want everyone to know this amazing, amazing trip journey that you can mm-hmm, take mm-hmm. and changes your life completely so amen um so yes um so I, you I, met me i met and your life me. changed forever no. <laughs> <laughs> you met me and I what what you. was what was it uh, i've never i actually have never asked her this to be honest well i think our friendship mm-hmm. and like i talked about 
you want to share it with all your friends. Mm -hmm. And I invited other people at work that time too. But, yeah, you did. But I didn't know all of that was going on, but I sensed, you sensed that, you know, I, I think I have that perception about what's going on in, in people's lives just by kind of watching. And, and so I invited Nadia and Patrick mm -hmm. and um, four other girls from work. Yeah, we did. And yeah. it was, it was amazing. So that was, I don't know if I'd done a couple before then, but that one was in my home. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. so she offered us a date night every week in her home. She baked good things and made us coffee. And surprisingly to me, I went home after her invitation and I mentioned it to Patrick. Uh, and he said, okay, sure. I love Joan Sue. That was it. So I thought, well, at least I can tell my therapist that we're going on a date night every week, <laughs> right? And I don't know if you remember this, but you actually, you and Shannon Stark, who was a believer as well at the time, got babysitting for me. So there was, they actually removed the obstacle of like my kids care. And another believer, Shannon, who took the course with us at the time, her mom actually, a stranger, I must have been a terrible mother, a stranger <laughs> came right into my house, babysat my kids while I went to Alpha. And so there was zero reason why I couldn't go. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, okay. So uh, were you praying for me in advance of I inviting? I pray in advance. Yeah. I mean, approaching people that you work with, you know, what are they going to think? Just what you said. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness, she's a Christian. We're back up now. Um, and so it, it was a risk, but I always pray before I would ask anybody, you know, God, is this somebody that I should ask? So for sure. Yeah. And how many alphas have you done? <laughs> you're about an alcoholic, I think. You're, you're about the same alcoholic as me. Well, I really think it's a gift that, he, that God's given to me. I, I think agree. It's, it's, um, I, I want to go on doing alpha as long as I can. So I, uh, at our church, we do two a year, one in the spring and one in the fall. And I, I actually have lost track, but I think it's... Um, you're going to be over 20 years. It's way over 20. It's not, it's not 20. Oh, move the mic up a little. It's way over 20. It's way over 20. Like, that was 2005, and you had already run three or four, and now we're in 2023, just in case you were wondering what year it was. So you've run way over 20. I think she's probably nearing 35 or 36, but I just did a little count. It is an amazing, amazing program. Yes, if it you've is. never taken it, please yeah. take it. There's a youth, pass, youth alpha as well which now we're offering in our She's church at the same time. She's just taking over. I love it. And I tell you, it, if you want your kids, your youth, to, it's just yeah. because it answers all the questions. Yeah. You know, you may Takes be the pressure there off. going, why, yeah. why should I read the Bible? Yeah. So it answers all So those can I, I, I ask permission before I'm asking this question, so don't hate me after this. How old are you, Sue? 78. And you're Ooh. still serving. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you can go, you can go and sit down now. Um, so she's 78. She's probably run 35 to 50 alphas. I please, twice a year for, okay, do the math. Anyway, she's not good at math. <laughs> uh, and so Sue and I actually serve together now. I recruited Sue to volunteer in my current ministry life, and so I get to see Sue every week. Oh, so sorry. There has never been a year that Sue hasn't prayed for me. Okay, just one sec. Every day. Yeah. Okay. So guys, this is evangelism. This is it. It's not complicated. It's not forcing any beliefs. It's going, it's teaching, it's baptizing, it's forgiving, it's making disciples. Sue acted on the command that Jesus gave her. When she found the good news, she delivered the good news to others. She went out, she found people. God brought people to her. She did the courageous thing in our world today and she asked a question, hey, have you ever considered faith? Not one time in my relationship with Sue have I ever felt that she's been forcing anything on me. I felt loved, as you can see, I felt loved. I felt cared for. I felt seen. I felt heard. I felt like maybe she had the answer and I was just so desperate for an answer. And she did. 
She had the answer, and she wanted to share it with me. And there was nothing that she did that made me feel uncomfortable. She, there was nothing that she did that made me feel like I was being criticized. In fact, every time I felt unsure, she told me, I've been there, I have been in that place, and I know that pain, and I want you to not have it anymore. So just keep working at it. Just keep trying. Just keep getting closer to Jesus. She still does this for me today. All the time. So, this is evangelism. It's not complicated. We make it complicated. We get scared. We get fearful. We put obstacles in the way. And I want you to know that that's not from God. That is 110% the devil. Because the last thing he wants is his church to grow. And by all accounts, what I'm seeing here at Collective is that it's growing. Praise God. (sighs) So now we'll get to the heart of the matter. (laughs) There are some things you need to know. There are some steps that you need to take. It's not always easy, but I want you to know something. You are already in relationship with the person that God wants you to bring to church or to Alpha or to have a conversation with. You're not standing on a street corner. This isn't a Billy Graham movement that he's asking you to do, although that was amazing. Um, What he needs you to do is just notice. You are 100% already in relationship with the person that he wants you to invite into a conversation of faith. I mentor some young people in my life. Uh, One of them, my beautiful daughter, Sarah, who's sitting right over there. And the other one, McKenna, is somewhere here. I just saw her somewhere. She's not going to put her hand up. She's going to hate that I'm doing this. Uh, There she is. Um, And those two young people, McKenna is 21, and Sarah is 16. I should know that. I gave birth to her. Uh, And they are, you can't ask them to not evangelize. They, They are looking at every corner in every little iota of the world, in every part of their hallways in the high school, or their friendship base on Instagram, and they are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in every way that they possibly can. It's like asking them not to breathe. And so that is the thing. You have to understand you are already in relationship with the people that he wants you to bring into the conversation. Second, The best thing that Sue did was recognize my suffering. The best thing she did was recognize my sin. She knew I was struggling, whether it was God that put her on her, could put me on her heart, or whether she just paid attention to the slow decrease in my lively, like my life, my passion. As you can see, (laughs) I'm passionate. But Sue paid attention to my struggles. And I want you to know, there it is, I want you to know that God was working ahead of her in my pain. This is a Bible that my husband was given at his work years before, 2000, year 2000, the year my son was born, where he declared himself a Christian and never told me. He never once told me. His desperate cries for our marriage to be saved started then. And God worked in his heart to soften it so that when I came home and said, hey, Sue, Sue Barnes wants me to do this thing, like, I don't know if they're going to say yes, because, like, it sounds kind of, like, crazy. <laughs> but she wants us to come to her house and watch some videos. And he's like, okay, let's do that. And in week five, I should add, because this person is no longer with us, she's in heaven with Jesus. Week five, we started talking about the church. I think that's week five or week six. And I had a friend out of nowhere, a business colleague, realized that I had left my job at the peak of my career and said, hey, where are you? What are you doing? She was actually a, like, really like a sponsor. Like, I, I didn't want to tell her what was going on in my life. I just left. She called me out of nowhere, found my phone number, called me out of nowhere, and invited me to church. And that's how I started going to Forest City Community Church. So God was working ahead of Sue and Wanda McKay at the time and like really paving a way for this to be the easiest possible thing for me. So pay attention. Pay attention and recognize the pain of others. See the suffering in your neighbors. This is the greatest commandment. Everybody should know the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the way that we love is by introducing our neighbors and our friends and our coworkers to Jesus Christ. The second thing is, or the third thing is, is radical hospitality. Whoa, we've got, a, we've got something for you guys. I'm so excited. 
<laughs> Sue talked about Alpha. Alpha is remarkable because it takes all the pressure off of all of you. Who here has done Alpha? Put your hand up. Yeah, so you have lots of people you can ask about Alpha. We are starting a new Alpha May the 4th, right? Is that the date? Okay, good. May the 4th, and I told, I told Tyler that this community is not going to let me down, right? He should be ready for at least 30 to 40 people. Wow. <laughs> so that means you have to invite and bring. Haha, <laughs> don't let me down. I'm coming back in two months to check in. <laughs> Listen, I need you to understand that exactly what Sue just said about Alpha is true. This is one of the programs that I have not found a better program to introduce people to faith. It is remarkable. It changed my life. I remember driving home from one of the weeks, and I think it was the week on forgiveness, and I had a lot of forgiveness to get, like, to seek, and a lot of forgiveness to um, seek and give. Yeah, that's it. Um, all that. Uh, and I remember Patrick and I were driving home in complete silence, which is rare for us because we're both extroverts, and we usually talk to fill the silence. Um, and we both looked at each other with tears in our eyes, both of us, and said, I feel like we're on the cusp of something really big, and I'm a little scared. And for the first time in a really long time, we held hands. And we both, in our fear of what was about to come, thought, this is amazing. Like, why would Sue do this? Why would Bev watch our kids? Like, why is this so important to them? And we realized that their radical hospitality and those videos, they were opening our hearts to the Holy Spirit. We didn't know it at the time. Thank goodness Sue didn't say that because we probably would have run in the opposite direction. But now I look back and I think my heart was being softened to Jesus. I mean, he was always there. I just didn't know it. And somebody took the time to provide really radical hospitality for me and say, hey, we've got a better way. This is the last one, and this is, this is the most important. And I don't think we talk about this enough. I really don't. you got to realize what's at stake. Like, this is life or death. John Mark Comer, who is one of Tyler and I's most... I think we have crushes. I think we have a crush. <laughs> yeah. Um, John Mark Comer... I mean, it's not that kind of crush. Like, it's just a... Theo, it's like a theological crush on John Mark Comer. <laughs> Like, just to be clear, I want that on record. Uh, I love my husband dearly. Um, uh, John Mark Homer, who's one of our favorite theologians, says that evangelism is so crucial because Christians must, must, must realize that Jesus is just one generation away from being extinct. When I heard that, like, my, my, I actually paused the podcast and I thought, well, that can't happen. One generation from being extinct. So what I need you to understand is that if you don't spread the gospel, we're literally one generation, Sarah, Sarah, one generation from people not knowing Jesus. And that can't happen because the church is so vital. It's vital to mental health. It's vital to family. It's vital to um, the growth of our society. It's vital to healthcare. It's vital to everything. There's nothing about the church that isn't needed in our society. In fact, I, I would dare I say, as a selfish person living in this world right now, that it's needed more than ever than before. We need to spread the good news because we're one generation away from it being extinct. So this is a life or death issue. I often say to my staff on Fridays when the work is overflowing and Perhaps I'm suggesting we leave early, which I do often. Um, I always say to them, you know, we're not curing cancer. <laughs> if Linda's in the audience, she's going to kill me. Uh, but we actually are because we deliver the good news every single day. Every single day we are working hard to make inmates aware of the love that they can receive from Jesus Christ. Every day we want them to transform their lives by knowing, just simply knowing and accepting an invitation into knowing who Jesus Christ is every single day. This is a life or death issue. I'm going to leave you with this story before we do a little exercise. I heard this story, and I can't get it out of my mind. It was on some sort of stupid reel on Instagram. So for lack of a better term, it's done me well today, social media. But it's a good story, and so I thought I would share it with you today. 
Um, there was an atheist speaking to a pastor. If you've seen this, I'm sorry, I'm probably not telling it exactly right, because you know how those viral things, they go everywhere? Anyway, um, he was speaking to an atheist, and the atheist actually said something like, if you don't ev evangelize and tell people about Jesus, I have zero respect for you, because it's the most hatred thing you could do. You actually believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and you don't tell people every single day, every minute of the day, you're not declaring it, that means you hate humanity because you actually are sending them to hell. And I went, well, I don't want that. But isn't that atheist somehow right? Like, if we're not declaring this, if we're not showing people the way, how will they find it? What will they know about Christians that we're not willing to take the risk of offending in the name of Jesus? I think he's, he's on to something. We are known as a society of Christians who love. And love is about introducing people to the good news of Jesus Christ. The best news ever. He died for me. He died for you. He died for your neighbors. And through his resurrection, he showed us a way back to God. And we have to start declaring that and being proud of it. And we're going to do something right now. This is something that I used to do when I ran Alpha. I, too, have now become an alcoholic. I haven't run one in a while. Maybe I'll come back here and run one one day. Um, uh, I've probably run 20. I lost count, too. We, we don't count because, quite frankly, we would see that we might have a problem with running too many Alphas, so we don't count. But um, you have a little note card and a pen in front of you. Pick that up. So there's a couple of my previous Alpha leaders that I invited in the room. You'll remember this, guys. But um, we used to, Jess is here. I see her now. Sorry, the light was glaring. Um, so the only way to invite this person into the conversation is for you to do the inviting and the bringing. And we're going to run an Alpha here at Collective May the 4th. Tyler tells me he's fully prepared for 40 to 50 people. I think we should totally show him what we can do. Uh, and the way we're going to start today is we're going to pray. While I was talking today, maybe even while you were coming to church this morning or throughout the week, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, because the Holy Spirit is so alive in this church, that somebody was brought to your mind. Someone came to your mind, a name, a face, a neighbor, a coworker. somebody came to your mind. And what we used to do during our Alpha training time was we would um, do this at the very end of our training time with our Alpha hosts and helpers, and we would write names down on a card. And so what I want, to, want you to do is just take a minute and write some names of people who need to know Jesus, doesn't matter where they live. I don't care whether you can invite them to Alpha or not. I just want you to write their name down on that card. Just take a couple minutes and do that. Heads are still down, so I'll wait. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to all stand up. I usually end in prayer. We're going to just take a minute to just... Sit and think for a minute while I pray. I just want you to just close your eyes. I want you to raise the cards up. If your arms get tired, that's okay. Raise the cards up. Each one of these cards represents a soul that needs to know Jesus. Each one of these cards is a Nadia and a Patrick from 2005 who's struggling. And so I just pray, come Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Not only are you welcome, we are excited to have you in the room. We can feel your presence, and we know you are here. 
For those of you that are new and don't understand what I'm doing, just enjoy the moment of knowing that the people beside you are praying intentionally for your hearts and minds. Each one of those white cards, God, we lift it up to you in a representation of giving that person to you. They're already yours. They just don't know it. I was already yours, and I didn't know it. And now I look at this life that you've given me that's dedicated 100% to you. And I want that for every person on those cards. I want that for everyone sitting here. I want them to be excited about this good news that your son died for us. I want them to walk in relationship. I want them to be as excited about their faith that's, as Sue Barnes is, as tired at the end of the day, smiling, inviting people into this conversation. And so, Lord, we give these names as an offering to you. We ask you to walk ahead of us. We ask you to open doors. We ask you to miraculously make moments of invitation for May the 4th, when we will start a new conversation here at Collective Church. We ask you to walk ahead of us, soften those hearts. And if there's new names in the coming weeks, may each person take those new names, add them to the card, put them on a fridge, put them in, their, uh, in front of their laptops, and pray for each one of those names as they come forward. And may you be brave, church. Collective church, may you be brave. I see growth happening here already through evangelism. It must be happening. Look, it's happening. The chairs are full. May you be brave, church, and say, hey, I see your suffering. I want what's better for you. Jesus is the way. Come to Alpha. Lord Jesus, I lift up my words to you today. I pray that I blessed you. I love you, Jesus, so much. And I am so thankful for the work you've done in my life. I lift this all up to you. And the church said, amen.